what I'm going to do next is talk about the parahippocampal place area as one of the first regions that was identified uh, besides the hippocampus um, that was identified in rats long ago. Um, and, we'll and I'm going to talk in some detail about the experiments that identified the functions of the parahippocampal place area, um, in part to give you a sense of what it does, but also for my methodological agenda of getting you guys to understand um, how you take a finding and chase after it. Okay, so this is a little bit self-serving and autobiographical because this work was mine 20 years ago with my postdoc Russell Epstein, but I think it's a nice inroad into this literature. So I mentioned this briefly when I, on the first day of class when I told you guys the story of Bob. And I mentioned that part of what was so eerie to me personally about Bob's deficit is that 20 years before or 15 years before that happened, we had found this region of the brain that seems to be involved in some aspect of navigation. And I already had a hunch about um, what might be going on with Bob and that I should have known this actually years before he ended up in an emergency room. Um, anyway, that piece of research started when my postdoc Russell Epstein, as I told you guys in the story, didn't want to do a brain imaging experiment at all. He was a purist, psychologist, doing nice, honest behavioral experiments, not doing the flashy, trashy neuroimaging, which at the time was hot and pretty trashy, actually. And, uh, and he's like, I'm not doing a neuroimaging experiment. I said, Russell, just scan people looking at scenes. It's stupid, but you're interested in scene perception. Just do it, right? So this, this view you get when you read papers and hear most people lecture that everything starts with a grand hypothesis and then you do the beautiful experiment and it answers the grand hypothesis. Now, often science is just you stumble into weird things and then you need to realize if you stumble into gold, you need to recognize it and go with it, okay? So this is that, that's this story here. So Russell scans subject looking at scenes and objects really for no good reason, kind of because I told him he needed to be able to show an activation in his, in his job talk. And he sees this. I wonder if we could, the lighting is not great. But anyway, what this is, is this is a series of slices through the brain like this. And like Idan told you, that reasonably, uh, deta that reasonably nice detail is from the anatomical images over which we've, um, we've put the activations in color. So this region, these are, these are slices through the head like this. Everybody oriented? Yeah? Okay, so that region is like bilateral, I don't know, straight in there or something, way deep in the middle. Okay. Um, <laughs> And what the colors are telling us is that region responds more when this person was looking at scenes than when they were looking at objects. Just random pictures of places, indoor, outdoor, whatever. Okay? So let me show you. So then, um, and so we named it the perihippocampal place area because it seemed to respond to places. Um, and, um, and what was really astonishing about it is that it's just incredibly robust and reliable. Here it is in nine people how incredibly stereotyped it is. Boom, boom, boom. Like every subject in exactly that same location has this specific activation or this higher activation for scenes and objects, okay? So we don't know what that means yet, but nature's telling us there's a systematic thing there, right? And when nature serves up a systematic thing, those are the things you should go study. More than the desperate little pathetic tiny effects that just reach significance if you run enough subjects, barely. Like, bleh, that's, that's no fun, right? <laughs> they probably won't replicate. If you see a big honking thing, redirect your research and go after that. That's what we did. Okay, so we said, okay, let's try to get a handle on this. Let's present scenes and objects again, and we'll throw in a couple other categories just to fish around in the space. But one of the first things we, we wanted to worry about, which has already come up in some of the previous topics is, well, how do we know it really responds more to the scenes than the objects? Like there's, you know, the student center versus an iron and a bunch of scenes, bunch of objects. These might be bigger and darker and higher contrast and more straight edges and God knows what, right? So there's a million low level accounts that might produce a higher response to this than that. Everybody with the program on that, we've talked about lots of cases like this. Okay, so our first salvo to try to say, okay, let's make a token gesture in the direction of seeing if it's just the component visual features that are driving that response. So we chop the images up into bits and scramble the position of the bits. And then when you do that, you get all these edges. And so we're like, oh God, we better stick edges on top of both. Okay, so that was like, it's kind of sloppy, but there it is. Okay, so that's a first experiment. Okay, all right. So then this is just some details. They don't matter, but in case it's feeling vague and you want coherence, here's a five minute scan 
Subjects stare at a dot for 20 seconds. They see a bunch of objects for 20 seconds, a bunch of chopped up faces, a bunch of non-chopped up houses, etc. Okay, everybody get that? You're lying in the scanner getting scanned while you look at those things. In each of those 20 second periods, these images are being flashed on at a pretty rapid rate, kind of like this, okay? So you're just lying there looking at the stuff, we're scanning your brain. So this is palindromic because it starts with intact objects and goes this way and then it flips around the other way. Most labs don't do that. I made this up 20 years ago, probably in this experiment. I did it because I thought there are all kinds of artifacts that might produce a ramp. Right, so imagine, like at the beginning of, have you ever been in an MRI experiment? By the way, if anybody wants to be in an MRI experiment, email me or Sarah, you're totally not obligated, but it will give you a healthy skepticism for all this stuff I'm serving up. You'll say, oh my God, I was asleep for half of it, I wasn't too embarrassed to tell her, but she's gonna think, you know? Anyway, there's all kinds of stuff that happens. One of the things you'll notice is, at the beginning of a scan, most subjects are like, okay, I'm alert, I'm with the program, I'm doing the thing. And then halfway through, boom, you're daydreaming, you forget to do the task, you fall asleep, God knows what happens, right? So there are all kinds of ways in which you might get a ramp in your attention, your um, engagement with the task, in God knows what, okay? And so if you have an artifact that's gonna produce a ramp on top of your response, then if you have a palindrome in the orders, it will cancel. See what I mean? You can do completely random order, probably more people do that than palindromes, the advantage of a palindrome is that in a single scan, you have at least a prayer of a hope that if there's some ramp-like artifact, it will cancel. But that's sort of BS because no ramp-like artifact is gonna be a perfect linear ramp, it's gonna be some weird function, right? So it's just a, it's like a gesture in that direction. But you could totally do it in a random order too. If you were doing like, um, more than 10 of these runs, you would absolutely randomize the order. If you were doing just, say, two runs, can you see why you wouldn't necessarily want to randomize the order? Because those two random orders might be weird in some way. So you might want to control it a little more. Yeah? Oh, yeah, is it counterbalance? Um, yes, you can do all of that, too. You could do a whole Latin square counterbalancing of the order. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, everybody got the gist of what this experiment is like? Okay. Okay, so we do that, and so, Idan, did you mention, you didn't, okay. Okay, you didn't, okay. Okay, I mean, that's where we stopped. We stopped. Okay. no problem, perfect, I didn't want to be redundant. Okay, so another little methodological sidebar, which isn't crucial for navigation, but which I haven't managed to fit into a lecture yet, so we're gonna do a little obsessing for five minutes on this. Um, very often, especially if you have a particular region of the brain that has a particular activation profile that you want to study, a good way to study it, not the only way, but a good way to study it, is to run a, a localizer scan to find it, and then a separate scan to ask it a question about its response, okay? And there's a bunch of reasons to do that. One reason is, even though I showed you for the PPA that it's remarkably stereotyped in its precise location across subjects, if we used some kind of group coordinate system that we plunked down on everybody's head, it wouldn't be in exactly the same position in each subject, right? And so if you want to study that thing, you got to find it in each subject because it'll be in a slightly different place in that subject from someone else, okay? A second reason, you didn't talk about multiple comparisons, did you? Okay, a second reason to do this, which I'll only, this is not a statistics class and I didn't prerequisite statistics, but I'm going to give you this gist if you can get it and if you don't, it's not a catastrophe. Um, so here's a problem, if you do, the GLM analysis, like you did in the problem set that Idam put together, you're doing that analysis on each three-dimensional pixel in the brain, each voxel in the brain, of which in a typical scan there are about 50,000, okay? So what happens if you use a statistical threshold of p less than 10 to the minus five on 50,000 different tests? Even if there's nothing there in the data, right? Absolutely, if you take pure noise, if you take 50,000 batches of pure noise and you run a statistical test on each of them at a criterion of p less than 0.05, you'll get lots of stuff, right? And for that reason, you have to be very careful in brain imaging and you need a really high statistical criterion to believe the stuff that you get. Because otherwise it could be just, you're bound to get some stuff and this is, the, this is the junk, this is the noise. Okay, so one strategy is to use an extremely stringent statistical criterion. 
So instead of p less than 10 to the minus 5, you might need p less than 10 to the minus uh, 4 or something like that, like some really stringent level. But that kind of sucks because it's hard to get significance at that level. So another solution is to say, OK, I want to know something about the PPA. So first I'm going to find it with a couple of scans. I'm going to find the bit that responds more to scenes and objects. And then when I found it in that subject, I wrote down these you know, 87 voxels are the PPA in that person. I have them now. Now I do a new experiment. And now I ask, does the PPA respond more to you know, penguins than turkeys, or whatever question you want to ask it right? in a new set of data? Now I can look in those 87 voxels, and I don't need to discount my p-level at all. I can go with 0.05, because I'm doing one statistical test, not 50,000. Okay? If you got that, good for you. If you didn't, don't panic. Okay? All right. Um, so that's why in these early experiments, we defined the PPA with one set of data using a contrast of scenes versus objects, just like you did in the problem set for sentences versus non-words, but in this case, looking at scenes versus looking at objects, you find something like that in each subject. Then having found it, we measure its response to that experiment I described with all those different conditions. Okay, so this is just the time course of the raw data in that region. No GLM, no nothing, okay? Um, and you can see, if you look at it, oh, there's two big peaks. Oh, that would be the intact scenes. Cool. Responds more to the intact scenes than any of those other conditions. Okay, then we can get really fancy and measure the height of that. I'm just kidding. It's very, very low tech. That's the other reason to localize the region and then test it, is you can do just the lowest tech um, uh, stats possible. My first paper on the fusiform face area, I analyzed the data in Excel. I'm not kidding. In Excel. I had time courses like this. I didn't have anyone to show me anything. I had no idea what I was doing. I said, oh, I can pull that time course out. And then I just measured those responses in Excel. Nobody does that anymore, not even me. But just to show you another advantage of this, it's very, very transparent. You see everything, right? OK. So um, OK, I just said all that. OK, so when you do that, here are the magnitudes, the height of those peaks um, in, in beta, for example, to each of those conditions. And oh, it's much higher for scenes than anything else. OK, but as we said, the reason we chop them up is we want to know is that just because there's more junk there, or higher contrast, or more edges, or whatever, right? So what happens when they're scrambled? Not much of a little bit of a difference, but not much. So if we want to cancel that out, we can look at that difference, OK? And what you see here is if we subtract out the response to the scrambled version of each, and then look at what's left, you see a huge response to the scenes much more than anything else. There's a little bit of a response to houses more than other things. But the, the thing that this region really likes is that. Everybody got it? OK, so you'll find lots of papers that use houses versus objects or houses versus um, uh, faces to identify the, the parahippocampal place area. And you guys now know why that's a dumb idea. Scenes work much better. But this is lost on lots of people. They don't know the difference. OK. All right. OK, so now, um, now we have this fact that the PPA responds more to scenes, indoor and outdoor, than it responds to faces and objects. OK, now what are we going to do with that? What does that mean? Does that mean this is a specialized brain region all and only for navigating? No, why not? What else might it be doing? But OK, good. Darker pixels, busier. We dealt with darker pixels, sort of, in the previous experiment. Remember, we chop it up, we subtract that out. So it's not just darker pixels, but busier. Say more, what, you, what else that might mean. Um, well, like even in the last picture, like that, the house and scenes like still had a lot more dark pixels. Um, and I guess like there's just a lot more going on, like a lot more features to attend to that are different in a scene. Like in these pictures, like there's like a plant, some kind of furniture or anything. Right. It's like a face is just one, like one thing. Right. OK, so again, darker picture pixels, we've dealt with that. That was pretty trivial. We dealt with that one. But this whole other pieces of this idea, it, there's just a whole lot going on. It's complex. There are multiple objects. There's a whole kind of crap going on here that isn't going on there. Like, duh. When you look at it this way, it's kind of unsurprising that there's a brain region that responds more to this than that. And there's any number of things that could mean. Right? Everybody get this? 
And this is like the main thing I want you guys to learn in this course, is how to think about data and what it can tell you and what you would do about it. All right. OK, so um, yeah, it could, what could this mean? High level visual semantic complexity. I took it off here. The, so it could be just overall high level visual semantic complexity in some ill-defined way. It could be the multiplicity of objects. It could be the fact that these objects have relative positions with respect to each other. Who knows? None of that is true over here. OK? All right. Um, but there's another thing that's different here. These images depict the layout of space. And these don't. It's pretty rudimentary. There's just a floor and a couple of walls and sometimes a door. But it's a kind of information that's present here and not there. Everybody see that? So this is a set of hypotheses. I'm sure you guys can think of more. There's an infinite number of them. Hypotheses about what it is that the PPA might really like. OK? So how would we go at that? Well, when I did this, I think Photoshop existed, but it was like, you know, this is 20 years ago. I didn't have it. And so this will amuse you. I literally drove around Cambridge, took pictures of my friend's living room, moved all the objects out of the way, and took another picture of the same place. I know, idiotic, but that's what it was like 20 years ago. Anyway, we made these stimuli <laughs> of the place, just the objects from the place, and just the background. Right? Do you see how it's pretty you know, dopey, low tech, but it's a way to take a whack at these hypotheses and try to figure out which of them fit better. Everybody get that? All right. So, um, so we ran that experiment. We localized the PPA. We measured its magnitude of response to each of those conditions. OK? Separate data. OK. And here's what we find. Magnitude of re response to the, big the full scenes is 1.3. Magnitude of response to the empty rooms, 1.2. Not significantly different from the full scenes. Like, what? Like, I was a subject in, in many of these experiments. I can't tell you how boring it is to look at these. At least here, you can think about whether the plant is healthy and whether you like the painting and whether you want to sit in the chair. It's like, oh my god, you're lying here. You're, you're like half asleep. You are so bored. But your PPA is going gangbusters. So when I said, there's this thing about spatial layout that's not immediately intuitively obvious, but it emerges in many different parts of the neuroscience literature as really core in navigation. And this was like the first one that hit us. Okay? So does everybody see how these data are consistent with this idea that that region really cares about the, the layout of space around you, not about the multiplicity of objects or the complexity of the scene? Everybody got that? Anybody want to ask a question? You guys are going silent. All right, if not, I'll ask a question soon. OK, um, so then we tried a bunch of different experiments. And I'll whip through these quickly, because they're not astonishing. But we said, OK, let's try to get a little more control over the visual properties. Let's take layouts of rooms. Let's cut them at their edges, so you can still kind of see the layout, but it's kind of fractured. And then let's move the bits apart, so you can't really see the layout anymore. OK? And when you do that, you get this response. Basically, it doesn't really drop when you add uh, lines in between. You can still kind of tell the layout, but it drops there. OK, so that's consistent with this idea that it's the shape of space around you. The shape is disrupted over there. OK? Then we said, OK, does it need to be real places? Or can it be just layouts of non-places? So we drove into Inman Square and bought a Lego set. And I stayed up late at night making some weird little Lego places. OK? Uh, and then to be more controlled about it, I said, OK, we've got Lego places. Let's make Lego objects. They're made out of the same stuff. And then by this time, it's like midnight. I'm in the build back when I actually did experiments. And I thought, oh, this would be fun. Let's stick some animals in there. There was no good scientific reason. I just was amusing myself. And so I made that condition <laughs> as well. Um, and then we kept our other, our other conditions. Now, we had already tested these conditions. Why would we run them again? We already know the answer to that. Yeah, uh, not Craig, no. Yeah. Oh, Craig, oh my god. You see, it's just like the 50,000 voxels. Like, if I guess enough times, I'll be right. OK, fine. Because um, if you want to like, get some of the same people, so like, you, if you're testing new subjects on those, you might want to compare, like, because of those variations between the subjects. Um, yes, yes. It could be different in different subjects, absolutely. So you want to like, retest those? Yes. Yes, absolutely. There are other reasons. Anybody think of other reasons? What about just plain replication? You guys all heard about the replication crisis? 
It's a big deal. Psychologists are getting the brunt of it, but this problem is across the board. I think psychologists are just taking it more seriously. So they get bad press because they talk about the replication crisis. Everyone else has a replication crisis too. They just don't talk about it as much as psychologists do. So there is a replication crisis. Lots of stuff doesn't replicate. And so it means that good experimental design entails build in a replication of the stuff you think you already know whenever possible. It's also helpful for all kinds of other reasons. Like if the subject fell asleep and we got totally weird data, we'd be able to tell because we'd get something different than what we got before. And a final reason is we want to know how these compare, not just to those, but we want to know, OK, how does that compare to these? OK, so it's nice to have the whole array so we can compare the, any one of them to each other. OK, so we run that experiment. What do we find? Um, we find we replicate this, always nice, doesn't care about the objects, only cares about the layout of space. Pretty amazing, right? Um, what do we find here? Well, it likes the Lego spaces more than the Lego objects, but not as much as the real places. OK, so this is a little bit of a gray area here. It's consistent with the idea that it likes spatial layout, but it's not consistent with the idea that any spatial layout, even if it isn't a place you could be, is sufficient. It seems to also care if it's a place you could be. Okay. Yes, this is one of my favorites. Okay, so finally, does the PPA care if this is a scene you know? You, you might think if it's involved in recognizing individual familiar places, one of the major things we do in navigation, like that's 77 Mass Ave, that's my living room, right? Those specific places that it would produce a stronger response um, when you see places you know than places you don't. Not necessarily, but maybe. OK, worth a shot. So um, what we did was we first thought, OK, we will take pictures of the MIT campus, and we will take pictures of the Tufts University campus, which some IT, MIT students go to, but not all that often. We'll choose MIT students who've never been there. And we'll scan them looking at pictures of the MIT campus and the Tufts campus. And we'll see if the PPA responds differently to the two. OK? Everybody got that? Well, it's kind of a B plus experiment. It's OK, but it's not great. Why is it not great? Yes? A college campus, like the Art Support, is still feels familiar because they have like very similar layouts, usually. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, might, it might seem generically familiar, like a campus or something like that. That's right. But let's suppose. That would be a reason why you might not get a difference, even if, there, even if there is a difference between familiar and unfamiliar. Let's think about if you ran this experiment and you found that MIT students produced a stronger response to MIT scenes than tough scenes, does that mean that the PPA is involved in um, scene recognition? That's right. So when you recognize it, all this other stuff happens after you recognize it. Like once you know it, as we just reviewed, then you can start thinking about, OK, where's the co closest coffee? Where is where's that with respect to blah, blah, blah? Absolutely. That's one very good reason. We're not going to solve that one here. Um, but there's another possible problem. Let's suppose they're just visual differences. Um, I guess, you know, I forget. I think Tufts has more bricks and we have more cement. We're so classy here with all our cement. Um, you know, maybe that would be just a difference between the response to cement buildings versus brick buildings. OK? They're different stimuli. Not great. What could we do about that? Yeah, you could. You could take your pictures of MIT and brickize it. I'm sure there's some software that does that. <laughs> you guys and your newfangled ideas. <laughs> yes, Vicki. Yeah. Yes, as tough students. Perfect. Everybody get how brilliant that is? <laughs> I mean, it's simple. The best ideas are really simple in experimental design. Right? So this is a counterbalanced design. We take the same stimuli, MIT scenes, tough scenes. We scan MIT students. We scan Tufts students. OK, so the same scene is familiar for MIT and unfamiliar for Tufts, uh, or the other way around. Everybody get how now, if we get a difference overall for familiar versus unfamiliar, it can't be due to cement versus bricks or any of the other visual details of those scenes. It could be due to the hypothesis Milot came up with, which is an important one of, is it all the things you think about once you know that familiar place? OK? Anyway. So we did that experiment, um, and we found almost the identical response in the PPA to familiar and unfamiliar scenes. 
Now, later experiments, this is like 18 years ago or something, later experiments have done more on this, and this, uh, it's, it's significant, it's tiny, and there are other brain regions that produce a bigger difference that we'll talk about later. But it's, you know, if it's there, it's very small. Okay. Um, now, again, that's tempting. It's tempting to say it's not doing familiar place recognition or any of those other things Milot mentioned, right? And that might be true, but it's complicated, right? It's possible that it actually is doing familiar place recognition, and that just doesn't make a whole bunch more neurons fire when the thing is familiar versus not. Right? We have this intuitive notion, or at least I have this dopey intuitive notion, that if you have a bunch of neurons that are doing recognition, when they successfully recognize something, they all go, yay, right? And produce a lot of neural activity. But maybe they recognize stuff without going yay in a way that we can detect, but they're still doing it, right? So this is an ambiguous result. Okay. All right. Okay, so summary, what are, where have we gotten? So there's this region that responds selectively uh, to scenes and automatically is based on something I didn't mention. It doesn't really matter what the task is. You can be passively do it, viewing it or looking at doing a particular task. When you remove all the objects, the response is unchanged. Um, when you rearrange the surfaces of the scene so that it's no longer a coherent space, the response drops significantly. Um, and the response is strong, um, reasonably strong, even to layouts that don't represent real places in the world. And it responds similarly to familiar and unfamiliar places. Okay, so all of this suggests that what this region is really doing is processing the shape of your immediate surroundings. Not the stuff in those surroundings, maybe not the particular place that is, but the shape of that space, where the walls and doors and windows are. Okay, everybody got that? The aspect ratio of the room you're in. Okay, nothing that we predicted in advance, right? Once we got this, my neighbor was, uh, was Liz Spelke, and I walked with that first experiment where we got the same response to the you know, fully complex real rooms and the empty rooms. I'm like, holy shit. And I walked into her office, and her eyes just lit up, and she says, I have some papers for you to read. And it turned out there was this long, wonderful old literature, which I'll talk about in the next class, showing that the shape of space around you is a fundamentally important cue in navigation. I had no idea until we discovered the result, and then we put it together. Okay. All right, um, so uh, this is just, you, you don't worry about this. This is just to say, this is an ongoing area. There's a lot of debate about precisely how specific the parahippocampal place area is in its response to scenes. And lots of people are niggling in various ways. Well, it does a little bit of this, it does a little bit of that. It cares about texture, it cares about semantic context, it cares about various other things. And there's probably some truth to some of that and it's all being sorted out. Nonetheless, nobody would disagree that the thing it really cares most about is whether the image it's looking at is a place, okay? 